So this is a, a passage that we all pretty uh, know pretty well. Uh, Jesus uh, walking on water is slightly different in John's Gospel to a couple of the others. He, he, he uh, strips it back. It's really um, simplified. But I just want to kind of lay the ground and the context of what is happening here. So uh, remember, um, John the Baptist went before Jesus. So John the Baptist, his ministry, he was a, 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 like an Old Testament prophet in the New Testament. He was like the turning point in the book. Uh, he was uh, represented the old, but also brought in the new. And he went before the people and he was fulfilling Old Testament prophecy in that he was preparing the people to open their hearts to God. Uh, and Isaiah said about him, about a voice calling in the desert, make straight your paths for the Lord. So uh, he uh, would go around and he would uh, preach uh, the kingdom of God and he would call people to repentance, to turn away from their sinful ways and prepare them to turn their hearts to God. And, uh, you know, that has, while it's like beautiful and fantastic, if you are realised and recognised that your ways are sinful and that God's aren't and you want to do something about it, then that is like honey to your lips. But if you are like, you just want to do what you want to do, and thanks very much, don't remind me of all of my sin, I just want to carry on doing what I'm doing, then it kind of like, it's a bit gnarly. And uh, he got on the wrong side of people uh, constantly, uh, and he got on the wrong side of Herod, and Herod, like the bigwig, he um, had him arrested, and uh, ultimately he had him killed, he had him beheaded, uh, Herod was uh, married to his brother's wife, uh, and uh, like the daughter of the wife danced before him, and he was just like, "Oh, that was just really brilliant! I'll give you up to my half of my kingdom. What do you want?" And uh, she's like, "Oh, I don't know." So she goes to her mum, like, "What should I ask for?" And she says, "Get John the Baptist's head on a platter." Not really very nice people, to be fair. Um, and uh, they cut off John the Baptist's head. John the Baptist was Jesus' cousin, and he was six months older than Jesus. So at this point, as just happened, Jesus hears that John, his cousin, who was preparing the way for him, has just been beheaded because of what he was doing. And Jesus takes the disciples and he wants to go off, presumably for a time of like just gathering uh, himself and them and to pray and to mourn. But on the way, as he goes out into like the desert area, all of the people start just coming towards him. And when he looks at them, he can't just carry on and do what he wants to do because he has compassion on them. And he says they're like sheep without a shepherd. He has to react to them because he sees their need. And he ministers to them, he teaches them, he heals the sick, and then he feeds them with bread. And then after that, the he sends the disciples off, so he goes up to the mountain and he has that time alone. I guess just to recoup. And then he comes down and then we get this account where he like walks on the water. The disciples are rowing like crazy. It's all pretty frantic. All hands are on deck. The waves are hitting and Jesus like just passes them by. And like I was looking at uh, N.T. Wright uh, uh, yesterday and in one of his commentaries. And he was saying this whole passage and the passage before he sees that John, the author of John's Gospel, uh, that he was trying to point to um, the Exodus, when God delivered the people of Israel out of slavery. And he likens it to like um, when they went into the desert and they were fed with manna from heaven, Jesus goes into the desert and the people follow him there and he feeds them bread. And then he likens like the parting of the Red Sea out into freedom as Jesus walking on the water. Now this is one of those miracles that a lot of people struggle with as well. And there's loads of like teaching of 
uh, like it was a really shallow lake and Jesus was actually walking on a sandbar. And, uh, and I just kind of think, okay, if you want to go with reason, then why did the disciples just jump out of the boat and walk on the sandbar too? I know they're Muppets, but come on, give them a bit of a, you know, give them a bit of credit. Sometimes you've just got to accept the impossible. And I was looking at this passage, and I've got to say, I could like preach for like hours, I won't, I could preach for hours on uh, the stuff in here, but I was like, okay, Lord, what do you what do you want to say for this? And actually, I really struggled. You, as, which is ridiculous because it's a brilliantly simple passage to preach on. But I'm like, I don't want to just preach on what I know. I want to know what He wants to share. That's a whole different ball game. That is. And when I was looking at the words that just kept speaking to me, were when Jesus responded to them, "It's I, don't be afraid." And I think like. I just thought about the whole passage, like Herod and John the Baptist. Herod was intrigued by John the Baptist, and he had him arrested. He didn't want to kill him because he saw that he was righteous and holy. So he recognised the fruit in his life, but it didn't mean enough to him. It didn't mean enough to him to change. So he wanted, like, to like. He wanted some information from him. He wanted to find out some stuff, but he didn't want to jump in on it. He didn't want to repent. He didn't want to turn to God. He just wanted to know what he could get from this religious guy who he was like intrigued by. And that was just so common and is so common today. With spirituality, we, we just like, we tinker with stuff. And the disciples, when I look at the disciples, they were afraid. What were they frightened of? If you look at that footnotes, it would say that they thought that he was a ghost. And if you look at further footnotes or any commentaries, when they say that they think he was a ghost, they think he was a spirit that comes out at night in a storm. And they were worried or afraid of a spirit at night. I don't know why they're not worried or afraid of him during the day. I don't think it makes any difference. They suddenly become nasty at night and they're like really pleasant during the day. Um, but they were like freaking out because of that. So they had this kind of Mickey Mouse belief and idea of, of who is Jesus. So they're like, the waves are coming. And I can imagine that when they're pulling, they're like, if only he was here. If only he was here. But Jesus arrives and he looks at them and he says, it's me. Don't be afraid. And I think so often we are afraid. At this point, I would just want to share that the disciples still haven't realised that Jesus is the Messiah. It's, it's remarkable when you think about what Jesus has already done. But they still haven't come to the point. There's another couple of chapters after this, the, the disciples, uh, Jesus takes them up to a place called Caesarea Philippi, which was called uh, Paneus, after like the Greek god uh, Pan. And it was all sorts of Mickey Mouse beliefs going on there. It was like a smorgasbord of spirituality. And Jesus took the disciples there. And when he gets there, he says, like, look at the circus, mate. I'm paraphrasing but he didn't actually say that but that like look at all this jibber jabber who do people say that i am and they're like oh that people say that you're like elijah and, and some of them uh, they're like oh, oh people say that you are a prophet and he says okay who do you say that i am and that's when so it's like after this but that is when Peter has his revelation from the Father. You are the Messiah, the Son of God. And Jesus like, you got it. That was given to you by the Father. So at this point, Jesus comes up to them next to the boat. And they still don't really get who it is. He says, it is I. It is I. Don't be afraid. And they let him into the boat, but they're still not quite sure who they invited into the boat. I remember when uh, I was in New Zealand, and um, 
I didn't know Jesus from Adam, and uh, I w hadn't been brought up a uh, Christian. I'd never went to church. My mum, well, I lived in Wales. My mum did take me to Sunday school once, and afterwards, all I remember she, her saying was, "We're never doing that again." And I don't think it was anything to do with the Sunday school. I think that's what I do with us. Uh, but there we are. Uh, we didn't really fit the slot. And. Um, so when I, I found out about Jesus, I was like in this room on my own on the other side of the world in New Zealand, reading this book and finding out about all these things about Jesus and about prophecy and things he'd done and things that were said about him like hundreds and even thousands of years beforehand. And I was like, well, okay, Jesus, if you are there, show me. And he showed me all the stuff that I had done. So he didn't show me himself. He showed me me. And all the people I'd hit during my life. But what he revealed to me in that instant was that he was there when I did it. That like he was there when I was six years old. He was there when I was 12, he was when I was 15, he was when I was 24, just like banging people. He was there when I did it. And I realized immediately that he was there when I did it. He was in the room with me, sharing this stuff with me. And I realized before I had even read a Bible that he was everywhere all of the time. That there was no getting away from him. Psalm 139, which I had no clue about at the time. Psalm 139 says, like, you can't get away from him. If you go up to the highest mountain, he's there. If you go to the depths of the earth, he's there. You go down to the depths of the ocean, he is there. And even darkness is as light to him. There is no escape. I didn't know those verses at the time. But when I read them, I'm like, yeah, I know it. Because of what he shared with me then. And this is what I knew. I knew nothing theologically. Like this is my first encounter with Jesus. But this is what I knew. You are awesome. I don't mean like, you're so cool. I mean, you are everything. And I am nothing. That's what I recognise straight away. Like, I hadn't thought that before. Before that moment, I was everything. It was all about me. Obviously. It was all about me. And then I encountered Jesus, and I realized it's all about him. I realized that he is the one who has all power. He is everything, and all of a sudden, I'm just like, he's creator, and I'm created. Like, he's the potter, and I'm the piece of clay that he has created. That, can you see like how that changes your perspective? All of a sudden, I was aware that he has got everything. And I didn't theologically know what to do, but I yielded to him immediately. It was another week before I went to church because I couldn't understand what church I'd do with Jesus. And uh, I, so I didn't put the two and two together. I thought it was a place for old women and knitting. I've got to be honest, I really did. Uh, that was uh, my experience, or I don't know where I got that from because I've never actually been to church to see that. But um, that's what I thought it was all about. And I'm like, what's that going to do with Jesus? Like, he is radical. He is everything. And a week later, I went into the church and I got there and everyone's being polite. I'm like, Get out of the way. I just need to go and sit at the front. I don't know why, and that's when people knew that I didn't belong because I sat right at the front. <laughs> He's either a minister or a weirdo. <laughs> I was a weirdo. And uh, the bloke got up and he preached, and it's just like every single word was to me. It was like there could have been no one else in the room. It didn't matter to me. God was calling me. And then the bloke says, if anyone here wants to give their life to Jesus Christ, just come up to the front now uh, while we sing this song. And I walked straight up and he went, what do you want? I'm like, I want to give my life to Jesus. He says, uh, kneel down and pray while we sing this song and then I'll get all the blokes in the church to come over and lay hands on you. I had no idea what any of that meant. The kneeling down and praying, like, what? Uh, uh, they're going to come and lay hands on you. 
that usually meant fight and talk. I had no idea what any of it was, none of it. I didn't care. Just knelt down and closed my eyes. I couldn't say I prayed because I didn't really know what that was. Just closed my eyes. And then all these blokes came over and they laid hands on me. I felt them boom, 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 boom. And then I got filled with the Holy Spirit. I didn't know who the Holy Spirit was, but I felt all powerful. Him. Incredible. And then I started to read my Bible and find out who this Jesus is. Who this God that has just entered my life, forgiven my sin, who he is. And I just think for us, like you come to church and the assumption is that you know who he is. But I never want to assume that. Because for some of us, we may think he's a prophet. For some of us, we may think he's this or he's that. But do we all truly believe that he is God of everything? The disciples called him into the boat. They knew there was like, they had seen enough fruit around him to know there was something amazing about him, but they still didn't know he was the Messiah. They still didn't know that this is the one that breathed the stars out. This is the one that in the beginning said, let there be light, and there was light. They didn't know that they were inviting the author of life into the boat. They just were letting in this amazing guy that's done stuff that they've never, ever seen before. And I just think, like, we all, from time to time, end up in that boat. You just do. Life is tough and sometimes it sucks let's be honest and like we sit in that boat and the waves smash against us one problem after another and you know what too often we just press the panic button and yet jesus just walks past the boat and says it is i do not be afraid it is me. Don't be afraid. And then you're left with a choice. Like, is he really God of everything in your life? Can you trust that he is God of everything in your life? Has he really, really got your back? Do you believe that? Has Jesus really got your finances? Or is he just going to let you just be kicked to the dirt? And then one day when you stand before him, you'll go, T -t 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 what am I here? Or is he with you saying, don't be afraid. Mm -hmm. I'm with you. With your physicality, with illness, with sickness, the thought of death. Is Jesus God in that? Or is he just some bloke who does amazing things and you hope somehow something positive might come out of it? Or do you believe that he is your king and he has got you in the storm? I just want to throw that out this morning because that's what smacked me between the eyes yesterday. It is I, don't be afraid. So I wanted to uh, remind us of who God is and where we can place him in our lives. Because we need reminding, because the storms, they come. And it's so easy and tempting to focus on those waves, isn't it? It's ridiculous how easy it is for us to focus on the jibber jabber and not to focus on the I am who is in control, not only of the waves and that boat, but the lake, the mountain, the people, the stars, the blackness in between the stars. He's got it all, all of it. He holds all of it. 
And we need to be reminded that our little problems are really, really not problems for him. Don't be frightened. It's me. So I'm just going to read this uh, from uh, a guy who got this old. Uh, I've read it before and I'll read it again. Uh, a guy called Dr. Lockridge, and he was spotted in the crowd at a conference a long time ago, and he was asked to come up and to the platform and to open the proceedings with a prayer. And this is a transcript of what he said when he was asked to just come up and pray. It's long. I'll take a deep breath. But while I read it, I want you to think about your life and where is Jesus in the storms? Where is Jesus in your security. The Bible says my king is a seven way king. He's the king of the Jews, that's a racial king. He's the king of Israel, that's a national king. He's the king of righteousness, he's the king of the ages. He is the king of heaven, he is the king of glory, he's the king of kings and he's the lord of lords, that's my king. Well I wonder, do you know him? David said, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament showeth his handiwork. My king is a sovereign king. No means of measure can define his limitless love. No far-seeing telescope can bring into visibility the coastline of his shoreless supplies. No barrier can hinder him from pouring out his blessings. He's enduringly strong. He's entirely sincere. He's eternally steadfast. He's immortally graceful. He's imperially powerful. He's impartially merciful. Do you know him? He's the greatest phenomenon that has ever crossed the horizon of this world. He's God's son. He's the sinner's savior. He's the centerpiece of civilization. He stands in the solitude of himself. He's august and he's unique, he's unparalleled, he's unprecedented, he's the loftiest idea in literature, he's the highest personality in philosophy, he's the supreme problem in higher criticism, he's the fundamental doctrine of true theology, he's the core and necessity for spiritual religion, he's the miracle of the age, yes he is. He's the superlative of everything good that you choose to call him. He's the only one qualified to be an all-sufficient saviour. I wonder if you know him today. He supplies strength for the weak. He's available for the tempted and the tried. He sympathises and he saves. He strengthens and he sustains. He guards and he guides. He heals the sick. He cleanses the lepers. He forgives the sinners. He discharges debtors. He delivers the captives. He defends the feeble. He blesses the young. He serves the unfortunate. He regards the aged. He rewards the diligent. And he beautifies the meek. I wonder if you know him. Well, this is my king. He's the king. He's the key to knowledge. He's the wellspring of wisdom. He's the doorway of deliverance. He's the pathway of peace. He's the roadway of righteousness. He's the highway of holiness. He's the gateway of glory. Do you know him? Well, his office is manifold. His promise is secure. His life is matchless. His goodness is limitless. His mercy is everlasting. His love never changes. His word is enough. His grace is sufficient, his reign is righteous, and his yoke is easy, and his burden is light. I wish I could describe him to you, but he's indescribable, yea, yea, yea. He's indescribable, yes he is, he's God. He's indescribable, he's incomprehensible, he's invincible he's irresistible you can't get him out of your mind you can't get him off your hands you can't outlive him and you can't live without him the pharisees couldn't stand him but they found out they couldn't stop him Pilate couldn't find any fault in him the witnesses couldn't get their testimonies to agree Herod couldn't kill him death couldn't handle him and the grave couldn't hold him 
That's my king. That is my king, yea. And thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever and ever and ever. And how long is that? And ever and ever. And when you get through all of the forevers, then amen. Good God Almighty, amen, amen. That is who the disciples invited into the boat. They just didn't know him. Do you know him? I'm just going to pray a prayer. And if you have never invited Jesus into your boat, if you've never done that before, if you've never asked him to come into your life and to be sovereign in your life, if you've never yielded your life to him, then here's an opportunity to do that. So uh, I'll just pray, and you just pray along quietly uh, beside me, uh, and uh, we'll just go with that. Let's just pray. Father, we have just uh, heard those magnificent words trying to describe you. There's just not enough words. You're just bigger than all of our words. We just submit our lives to you today. You are the potter, we are the clay. You are the creator, we are the created. So we just surrender ourselves to you today. And Father, we say, we're yours. We surrender our hearts, our minds, our bodies, our soul. We surrender them to you. And we ask that you would fill us to overflowing with your presence, with your spirit, and that our lives would be lived for you. Have your way with us. Use us. Forgive us our sins. And fill us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you just uh, prayed a prayer and invited Jesus into your life and you've never done that before, just grab me afterwards. I would love to pray with you and uh, to shout quite loudly in excitement at that happening. Uh, just uh, do that that's fantastic if you haven't uh, you, you, you've, you already you know him then praise God praise God how beautiful is that uh, let's stand together and sing our final song <laughs>